So using the while loop for input validation. I know we mentioned this. This is pretty important stuff. Input validation is a process of inspecting data that is given to the program as input and determining whether it is valid or not. You can use a while loop to create input routines that reject invalid data and repeat until valid data is entered. So for example, you know, we've had these programs that ask people for their age and for their height. I cannot type to that. No pet. So you could have something that looked like this. Let's declare two variables. Should I make y'all type this in, in Visual Studio? Yeah, we'll come up with another reason to do it. So let's declare two variables, height in inches and weight in pounds. And so we're going to see out a message. Enter your height in inches. And then we're going to see in into that variable, height in inches. But if it's invalid, now we have to decide what invalid means. I guess we could set an upper limit and assume that nobody's going to be more than 10 feet tall. That's probably fair. And we could say that it can't be a negative number. So CIN, excuse me, while height in inches, I'm just going to check for negative numbers right now. Non-zero data. While height in inches is less than one, we're going to print out an error message and we're going to ask them again. See out, please, positive numbers only. Like that. And then we do the same thing. We see out into your height in inches, and we see in there. And so that way we ask them, if they type in something great, excellent. We skip the whole loop, right? Because we only trigger this loop if the height in inches is less than 1. And we can do the same thing for weight in pounds. For weight in pounds, we can check for the same thing. We can make sure that they don't enter a negative number. This doesn't handle numbers that are too large, but we just have to modify this clause a little bit and modify our error message. You know, if we wanted to allow height anywhere between 1 inch and 10 feet tall, then the condition would need to be modified to support that. So let's do that for weight. So now we're going to ask them for their weight. And then we're going to read it in. And then we're going to check. Is there a problem with it? While weight pounds is less than zero, or weight pounds is greater than, we're going to say 2,000 is our upper limit. Not many people weigh more than a ton. We're going to say, we're going to give them an error message. Weight must be between 1 and 2,000. And then we'd ask the question again. Like that. I hope that makes sense. While loops used for data validation, what we're doing is we're just making sure that they've entered plausible data. Now, this doesn't handle the case where they enter in a word and it goes nuts looping, right? We, we already talked about that in a previous lecture. And my mind always blitz on how to handle it as soon as I'm done with that lecture. But, you know, you can uh, reset the error status of it, you know, and clear the buffer and then call the CIN again. It's not a bad idea to make these their own functions. That could be a function. And that could be a function. If we wanted to do that, we could do something like this. I would take this code and put it in its own function. Something like this. Int get height in inches. And then it would return that height when we were done. And I would do the same one for the same for the weight. I'm modularizing the code by putting this stuff in the, in the functions, in the modules. Something like that. 
And that way, when you were ready to use this stuff down in Maine, it would just look like this. Ant height and in inches, whatever, is equal to get height in inches, and then ant weight or pounds equals get weight in pounds. It's cleaning up the code inside of main. The complexity of it is being hidden inside these functions. And that's totally fine. When you're looking at main, it's nice and clean. And if you ever needed to modify this so that it asked for the values in centimeters or did some other kind of error checking, you'd have one place to go and look for it. Now, in general, we might want to write a function that accepts only positive values only. And we could do that. Or we might want to write a function that, uh, you know, does that error handling so that if they've typed in a letter rather than a number, it doesn't go berserk. And we stick that inside a function. So that whenever we want a piece of data, we can just call that function and it will do that error handling for us. That's a little bit beyond the topic of just writing looping, but this is an example of looping. Now, something to note here is that this is what's known as priming input or priming read. If you took 1113, you probably had, you know, lectures on. A priming read is when you have one input statement that sets up the while loop, and then inside the while loop, you have another input statement to read successive values. Usually, you think of priming read as something that sets up the data because you want the while loop to be executed. In this case, we're using the priming read, and if the data is valid, we don't go into it and do anything else. But it's fine. It's the same idea. I'm not fond at all of the priming read programming structure, where you have this same input code repeated twice. And it is. It's there, and it's there. We could rewrite this code in such a way that we only did input in one place, that we did it inside the function rather than outside of it, excuse me, inside the loop rather than outside and inside the loop. But I'm not going to talk about how we would do that now. I'm sure that I'll give you an example as we're typing up code the next time. So that is a priming read. So here's the general approach in pseudocode. You read an item of input. While the input is invalid, you display the error message and read the input again. Here's our example. Enter a number less than 10. CIN number. While that number is greater than or equal to 10, we tell them an error message. Error, enter a number less than 10, that got it, and then we let them type it in again. And the good old flowchart for the same. Read the first value. Is it valid? Is it invalid? Yes, it's invalid, so display an error message, and then read another value, and then go back and test it again. So counters. Loops, counters. A counter is a variable that's incremented or decremented each time the loop repeats. Usually you have your while built on a counter, in which case it's called the loop control variable. So the counter can control the execution of the loop. I want to write a loop that's going to count from 1 to 10, or 2 to 100, or 1,000 to 1, something like that. So your counter variable becomes your loop control variable. It's the one that's tested inside the while condition. You have to initialize your counter before you enter the loop. So in general, your loops are going to follow this process. You're going to have an initialization step. I'm going to short that to init. You're going to have a test step, which is where you check for your continuation condition. And then you have your update. That's generally what your while loops will have. So for example, int value equals 0, while value is less than 10. This is our init. We're initting it. This is our test. And then we have something that happens. In this case, I'm just going to see out. That's the body of my loop. And then I have an update. Without the update, it would be an infinite loop because this condition would never become false. So this is our loop control variable. It's our counter. Value is our counter. It is our loop control variable. 
Could you have a counter without it being the loop control variable? Yeah, sure. What if you have some um, data where you're entering a series of test scores or whatever, and you don't know how many, so you tell the user, enter a test score or negative one to quit. And you're going to have a counter that's keeping track of how many test scores they've entered, but it's not going to be the basis of the WADA loop because there's no upper limit for the number of scores they may enter. So you'll be keeping track of a counter, but you won't be testing it in the while loop. The while loop will be some other test condition. Something like this. Int counter or scores is equal to zero, you know, and then int score is equal to zero. And then you could do this. While score is not equal to negative one, then we're going to ask the user to enter a score. And if it's a valid score, then we're going to in, add it to the total and increment our counter. Forgot to put that in there. Int total. That's our accumulator. So, C out, enter score, or negative one to quit. C in, enter our score variable. And then if score is not equal to negative one, then it's good data. Negative one is our sentinel value. So we have good data here if that is true, if that is, if it's not equal to negative one. If it is true, then we want to add the score to the total and we want to add one to our counter. This would let them enter data in over and over and over. Each time they enter a valid piece of data, we add it to the total. We increment the score by one. Whenever they finally stop, when they type in a score of negative one, this code will not execute, and we will exit the while loop. So what is our loop control variable here? It's the score variable, not the counter. But we are using the counter so that we can keep track of how many test scores were entered, like if we're going to calculate an average or something like that. And I should have made this type this one in. You know, the total divided by the number of tests, like that. Yeah, I think that is, this would be a good idea to enter in this actual code. But now let's go on. You're right, I have not attempted this course. So here they print out a table of numbers and their squares. Let's do the same thing, except let's change it to a table of numbers and then squares and then cubes. So let's actually open up Visual Studio. I must not have chosen the right thing. Empty project. All right, that's looking better. string using namespace system pause return zero all right enough of the good stuff write a table that prints the squares and cubes from 1 to 10. And 
after we start doing these tables is when we should introduce the idea of formatting our output so that it lines up nicely in columns. And so putting that out, um, data formatting stuff before we hit the chapter on loops is a bit silly. So we are going to go back to that earlier PowerPoint and revisit that concept at a certain point. But anyways, I need a loop control variable. I'm going to be real creative and call it X. I want to tell you what, why don't we be classy programmers and actually define our beginning and our end points, maybe as constants, or we could pound define them, either way. So I'm going to come up above main and do pound define begin one, pound define end 10. So now my initialization step is going to be to set x equal to begin, like that. And then my while loop is going to be while x is less than or equal to end. While x less than or equal to end. So let's perform some calculations. Let's get the square and the cube. Int sq is equal to x times x. Int qb for cube is equal to x times x times x. Crude, but okay. And then we're going to see out x followed by a tab, followed by the square, followed by another tab and then the cube. See out arrow, arrow, x, arrow, arrow, quote, backslash, t, that's our tab, end quote. And I'm going to the next line, but you don't have to. Arrow, arrow, sq, arrow, arrow, quote, backslash, t, end quote. And then lastly, arrow, arrow, CB for cube, arrow, arrow. We don't really need a tab at that point. We just need an ENDL. All right, now I'm, I'm fairly sure that this code will compile. But there's a problem in it. Did anybody see the problem without running it? Once you ran it, you'd see what the problem was instantly. Yeah, I'm not incrementing the loop, so it's going to be an infinite loop. So, plus plus x, or x plus plus. All right, here we go. Go ahead and add another column. What's it called if you take something to the fourth power? I don't know. Hypercubing? Yeah, it's, it's tesseracting <laughs> it. It's hypercubing it. Okay, and I'm just going to call it P4 for the power 4. Is equal to x times x times x times x. And then modify your print statements to print that as well. So a good question is, why didn't we put semicolons here? And the answer is, is that would uh, actually cause them to be syntax errors. Now that's kind of a, just a way of avoiding the question, not really. The reason why is because unlike Python, tabbing doesn't matter. And so the code that I wrote is equivalent just actually to that. And if we did put semicolons there, like there, 
or like there. You see it breaks it. So does that kind of make sense? If I wanted to put the semicolons there, it's totally okay. I would just have to treat each one of these as though it were a separate statement. And that's totally cool to do. But since I wanted to print out P4 as well, I need to make one more little mod. This is going to be CB, the cube, followed by a, a tab, followed by P4, and an ENDL. Okay. I think it would be later the point to, you know, keep adding various powers. How many could we fit, though? How many spaces do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we could conceivably go to one followed by seven zeros, which I guess is taking something to the seventh power. No need for that. So in this case, our loop control variable is x. I kind of just wanted you to see the idea of using preprocessor definitions to define your magic numbers, 1 and 10. The book's not going to show you doing that. The book would show you defining them as constants instead. If we wanted to do that, that would be totally cool. If I had not done it like that, here's what it would look like. I would just come up here and do const int begin equals 1, const int end equals 10. Is there a reason to prefer one over the other? Well, you'll see a lot of people define stuff like that as constants, excuse me, as preprocessor definitions, especially if they're going to apply to more than one file. If you have some array limit that you want to be applicable to, you know, several different .c files, C4P files in the same project, you might put it in a header. And you can't stick constants like this in a header, but you can stick preprocessor definitions in a header. I just kind of wanted you to see that. So did everybody get their next column added? Cool deal. The do while loop. Very similar to a while loop. Take this code here, all of this, copy it, and then we're going to make a few changes to it. Paste it, make a few changes. For one thing, the first change we're going to have to make is that, well, it's, it's letting me do that. I, I can't believe it really is. It's letting me read a clear X like that. Yeah, X is multiple definitions. Okay, so when you paste it, take out the word int the second time. And then change this right here. Change that just to the word do. Like that. No parentheses or anything. And then go and put while parentheses and put our, int, our condition down there at the bottom rather than the top. While x is less than or equal to all caps P and D. And then put a semicolon after the parentheses there. So the syntax of a do loop is it starts with the word do, and then it's got the loop body, and after the loop body is the word while, followed by the condition in parentheses and a semicolon. So what's the difference? Well, it's going to behave the same way. We're just going to get two, um, two tables that look identical. But there is a difference to the way they work. And the difference is, is that this is what's known as a post-test loop. It's called post-test because the test happens after the body of the code. Whereas a while loop, the test happens at the beginning of the code. So what difference does that make? If this was false to begin with, it wouldn't even print anything. Like if I change this to x is equal to 30. Don't have, you don't have to make that change. It's not going to print anything. Because when it says while x is less than end, end is defined as 10, so is x less than 10 if x is 30? No, so it's not going to do it. But if we come down here and we set x to 30, 
then the next line is do. Okay, I'm going to do it. It does all this, it prints it out, and then it checks. All right, is x less than 10? No, it's not. So then it's going to exit. So if you have a while loop, the code inside of a while, the block of a while will not execute if the condition is false. For a do loop, the code block will execute no matter what, and then the condition is checked. Kind of a subtle difference. And I really never had much call for actually using do loops. I just used while loops for everything, and if I needed to kind of bang on it a little bit to get it to work, I did. But you can. This is a post-test loop. This is a pre-test loop. I'm going to go ahead and change that to back how I wanted it. Begin and begin. So if we had this, int x is equal to 6, while x is less than 5, c out x, and then increment x. Or we had int x is equal to 6, uh, make it y. Int while y is equal to 6, do some stuff, c out y in dl, and then add 1 to y. Keep doing that while y is less than 5. Is this going to print anything? This one's not going to print a dang thing because 6 is not less than 5. This actually will print the value 6 because it's y is 6. Okay, let's do it. It prints out 6, it adds 1 to it, and then it checks. So at this point, y is actually 7. Is 7 less than 5? No. So this would print. We're going to say it prints nothing. Because the while is pretest. This prints one thing. The loop is post test. So our rules of thumb. We haven't hit what a for loop is yet, but I will mention them right now and then we'll get to it. Use a for loop for counter based loops. And when the series of data is already known to the program. That doesn't make a lot of sense yet because you, we haven't talked about them, but you've, you've seen for loops in Python or whatever. And then use a do loop if the body of the loop must execute no matter at least once. no matter the value of the loop control variable. And then otherwise, use a while loop. Those are kind of your, your order of things that you ought to be thinking of. Am I counting a series? Am I just making a counter? I use a for loop. Does the body of the loop have to be executed? No matter what, and usually people flip these two. So I'm gonna cut that one and make it reason number one. Does the body have to execute at least one time? Then I would use a do loop. Is it over series? Am I counting a series of numbers? I would use a for loop. Otherwise, I would use a while loop. You did not have do loops in Python, so they're slightly new. I have no idea why the inventor of Python didn't throw them in. I guess he assumed that anything that you could do with a do loop, you can do with a while loop, and that is true with, with care. Okay, so the do while loop, it's a post-test loop. The format is the do word followed by a statement, either a single line of code or a block of code in braces, while this expression is true, and then we do actually need the semicolon there. And I'll keep trying to reinforce the idea that you don't put semicolons on whiles and ifs. Well, you do on do files, but not on the do keyword, right? You don't put a semicolon there, but you do put it here. 
But my real rule of thumb is that any time you start indenting another line, there better not be a semicolon in front of it. So here, we started indenting. So any time you have a opening brace, there better not be a semicolon on the line above it. So while num's less than max number, if I put a semicolon there, that would have broken it because the next line is an opening brace. And here's the logic of a do loop. Do some code and then check my expression. Do this stuff while this expression is true. This is just showing that the, act, the body of the code gets executed before the expression is evaluated. So the loop always executes at least once. The execution continues as long as the expression is true. It stops repeating when the expression becomes false. Now some programming languages have do until loops. Do this stuff, and C doesn't, so I'm just going to erase this note. Do this until x equals 10. I like that syntax. It's kind of a neat syntax, but C doesn't support it. Neither does Python, neither does Java. So now that I've said it, just throw it away. So the for loop, the ultimate loop, the one loop to bind them all and then the darkness, find out, whatever. Okay, so its syntax is it builds the initialization, the test, and the update all into one statement. In Python, you probably had some for loops, and if you did, you probably used them like this, either for value in range, and then you had a list, you know, something like that, or you did for value in, and then you had a list or an array or something like that. You probably had one or two of those things. Well, syntax, we don't have a range in C++, but you do it like this. So here we had x is equal to 0, that was our init, and then we had while x is less than 10, that was our test, and then we had some code, c out x, and then we had an update, plus plus x, the for loop combines these three steps into one header. For init semicolon, test semicolon, update. That's its general syntax. So for x is equal to 0, x is less than 10, plus plus x. And inside the loop I would see out like that. So just as a point of reference, I'm going to copy and paste this stuff. You don't have to do this, but I want to show you what it looks like without all the comments visually cluttering it. Just going to de decommentify it. All right. You can see that. I hope you can see, especially if I scroll, that this is a more concise syntax, right? Specifies your starting position, your init, specifies your test, and specifies your increment all in one header. So if you don't have to use a do loop, I would tend towards using a for loop. But there are certain cases when a for loop is not appropriate. The for loops are perfect for counting. Here we're counting from 0 up to 9. That's perfect. We will also see that there's a variant of the for loop that you can use with arrays, just like you could do in Python when you did this for value in list, and then you printed the value out. You can do the same thing with a for loop in C++ or Java. For int value colon array name, do something with it. But we don't have arrays yet, so I'm not going to mention that anymore at this point. So let's write a couple of loops. So, quick yes, sir. Um, do you have to assign a value to x in the initialization, or if you had already assigned a value to x, could you just type in x? Excellent point. Excellent point. You can leave off any of those things. If you want to, you can do this. If you've already initialized x, great. 
right? That totally works. If you want, you can leave off the uh, update. I can't because I can't type. X is less than 10. And as long as something in here is updating the value of X, you can leave that off. If you want to be really foolish, you can leave out uh, all three things. But you better have some kind of test condition in the loop. You know, if X is greater than or equal to 10, break. Something to bake it, bail it out of the loop. X plus plus. So, yeah, these, these pieces are optional. And if you don't want to put that there because you've initialized it already, feel free to do that. You don't have, it wouldn't be a syntax error just to put X there like you were mentioning, but it's unnecessary. You just leave it out entirely, but the semicolon is necessary, so it knows which piece. So let's write a few loops. I'll do one for you, and then I want you to do a few. So somewhere above our pause statement, you can declare your variable as you initialize it with a for loop, and that's what I'm going to show. For int a equals 10, a is less than or equal to 20, a plus equals 2. So let's see out a at that point. And we don't need an update because it's handled by that code. So this should print out 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. Yeah, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So three more loops that I want you to tack on. Write one that'll count from 5 to 25, and then write one that by skipping by fives, so it'll be plus equals 5 rather than plus equals 2, and then write one that'll go from 26 to 35 by ones, and then write one that will go from 34 down to 1 by negative 1. So in other words, you're going to use like A minus plus minus rather than A plus plus or something like that. A minus, minus, minus A or something like that. Give y'all a moment to do that. So we'll throw that last one on there. Little test problem number four, revise the square cube P4 loop to use a four loop rather than while, displaying one to 20. Alrighty. I want to play long, so let's see. Write a loop that will count from 5 to 25. For parentheses, what should I do next? Yeah, I need to initialize. Did uh, everybody use A over and over, or should we pick different variable numbers? doesn't matter. I'm going to use B. But it doesn't matter since it's going to... This variable falls out of scope as soon as the for loop is done. So it really doesn't matter what variable name I choose. It's not going to conflict with anything else I have defined. B is equal to what am I starting at? If we're doing the first one, it's counting from 5 to 25. So B is equal to 5, semicolon. And then what's my test condition going to be? Yeah, B is less than or equal to 25. I see why you, I think I'm okay with saying I want to make it 25. Yeah. 
And then lastly, what's our update going to be? B plus equals 5. And let's see out that number. C out B in DL. Pretty Python themes. Here's how we would have done it in Python. For B in range, 5, comma, 26, comma, 5. Why would Python have used 26 there? Because Python didn't use less than or equal to as the upper end of its age range. It used less than. And if we were going to repeat that style here, I would not have less than or equal to 25. I would have less than 26. Now, I personally like using less than or equal to 2 in my point for general counting loops, so I'm going to leave it like that. All right, so the next one, count from 26 to 35. For int c is equal to what? 26. Keep going while c is what? Less than equal to 35, and then C++ plus plus or plus plus C, doesn't matter. If you put the pluses in front of the uh, variable, it executes a little fraction faster. Something that I didn't believe until I read it several times, so it must be true. All right, and now I'm going to print that out. C out, arrow, arrow, C, arrow, arrow, India. All righty. Counting from 34 to 1. 4, int d is equal to 34, and then d. Now, what should my test expression be? Yeah, greater than or equal to 1. The minus minus d, or d minus minus. C out d, e and d out. Seems to be working. Five all the way up to th thirty-five, then thirty-four down to. I don't know. I guess it's working. Five to twenty-five, twenty-six to thirty-five. So five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, and then it's twenty-six up to thirty-five by ones. All right. So that is working. Now I'm going to do this last one. Revise the square cube P4 loop to use a for loop. So I'm just going to go and grab one of these bodies here, like that. But I don't even want the update. So I'm just going to grab all of this. I'm going to copy that. And now. 4 int x equals 1 because I want to start at 1 and I want it to go to 20. x is less than or equal to 20. Increase x by 1 each time, plus plus x. And there we go. So the reason I mentioned set w is because what if our table included fractional values? It would be really hard to get them to line up with just tabs. What if we didn't want to use tabs? I'm going to modify this code so that it doesn't use tabs. Instead, it uses set w. So I need to include the IO manipulator header file. I'm going to scroll up to the top, pound sign include. Angle brace IO manip. Then I'm going to go back down to my loop and I'm going to remove all the tabs.
that instead, in front of each piece of data, I'm going to set the width of it. So it's going to see, say, C out, arrow, arrow, set W, maybe 10. Each column is going to be, each column on my table is going to occupy 10 spaces. And I'm going to do that for each one of these. I should just copy and paste. So if you wrote it all with one line, you only have to do it? Nope, you still got to do it each time. Set width only formats, exactly. Set width only formats the very next piece of data coming out the stream. So, yes, even if it was all in one line without extra C outs, Piece of data still needs to be preceded by the set W. Now the other, the other one we've seen, set precision, you do only have to call that one once. Hey, and what's different about that table now that I ran it? Yeah, it is right justified rather than left. We could throw in some more manipulators to cause the data to be left justified rather than right, but I think that's kind of cool. I'm going to leave that alone. So are we all good, or do I need to keep the code on the screen? Sure. That far enough, or we need to get to another one? Something else to note about for loops is that you can put more than one thing in this step. You could initialize several values. You can put more than one thing in the update stage. Can you put an and or an or statement in the test? Yes, okay. yes. So, One thing that I'm not sure about is whether we can initialize them both at the same time. I'll declare them, I mean. I'm going to try this. Don't necessarily type until I'm sure it's going to work. So this is acceptable syntax. We're declaring v1 and we're setting it equal to 0. We're declaring v2 and setting it equal to 10. We want our loop to keep repeating as long as v1 is less than or equal to v2. And for every update, we want v1 to increase by 1, or plus plus v1, and we want v2 to decrease by 1. And then let's just see out v1 followed by a space, followed by v2, followed by ENDL. So we should see it print 0, 10, and it goes to the next line. 1, 9, goes to the next line. 2, 8, 3, 7, 4, 6, 5, 5. And that will be the point where it stops, because at that point, v1 will no longer be less than or equal to v2. On the other hand, I could get build errors. It may actually be complaining about the fact that I tried to declare two of them at the same time. How about if I just...
packages. Done that. Is that acceptable? That is acceptable. What do you know? It did not like me declaring that there. I had to remove that second word yet. Now, if I had declared them above, as was my initial instinct, just having taught this to the C class, I could have done that, and then I would have just done V1 is equal to that, and V2 is equal to that. And the argument for doing that would be that the syntax that I just showed you, when you're declaring the variables inside the parentheses, that they would apparently all have to be of the same type, right? Because if I made V1 an int, then I couldn't have turned around and made V2 a double. But I could if they were declared up, you know, above it. I don't know which way is clear. I'm going to leave it like this now. So the takeaway of that is that your initialization step can initialize more than one variable of the same type. Your update step can do a whole bunch of things. You could list a whole bunch of things if you wanted to here. You could have your update step do 10 different things if you wanted to. Each one of these can be a function call rather than just setting a variable. If you want some function that's invoked every time an update is run, you can do that. But I don't know what. I don't have a function call display. But if I wanted to, I could tack that on as one of the things that we do for every update. Now, once you start making your for loops look that complex, then you might think about formatting them in a way that's a little bit easier to read, right? Now we're going back to this is our initialization, this is our, our test, and then this is our update. I'm going to get rid of that comma display, though. You don't have to modify your to match. I just want you to see that if the for loop starts looking too nasty, now, anything you can do with a for loop, you can also do with a while loop. I think that's a fair thing to say. In contrast, anything you do with a while loop, you can also do with a for loop. But that's not necessarily true of the do loop. It's a little bit more trouble to force a while or a for loop to behave in a, a post-test fashion. You can do that. But then you're probably just making it a while true loop that runs infinitely with a break statement somewhere in there to cause it to kick out. Okay, so breaks are the next thing I want to mention. What does a break do? It kicks you out of the loop, or it makes it skip all of the remaining statements in the body and execute the next line of code after the closing brace. So something like this. Let's just write a, another little simple for int x is equal to 0, x is less than 10, so it's going to count 0 to 9. x plus plus. And let's do some stuff. I'm not sure what it is, what we're going to say. A, B, C, D, E. And then we're going to test if x is equal equal to 6, break. And then C out, arrow, arrow, F, G, H, I, J, in, in quote, arrow, arrow, X, E, and D, L. So what we're going to see it do is that the loop's going to keep reiterating, but then finally, when x is equal to 6, it's going to kick us out of the for loop completely. Like that. And so it printed a, b, c, d, e, f, g, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then it printed a, b, c, d, e, but it stopped at that point. It didn't do anything after that. And the reason why is because it broke at that point. So it skipped this statement, and it jumped down to here. That's where the break went. Now, there wasn't anything after that except for a pause statement. Now, there's something similar to a break called continue. 
What continue does is it also skips everything left in the loop, but it doesn't cause it to exit the loop. It causes the loop to be reevaluated. So let's let's try that out. Let's do if x is equal to 3, continue. And I think I'm going to print out a final ENDL at the end just because I don't like that uh, pause message being on the same line as my output. Okay, so what this means is that by the time, when it finally reaches 6, it's just going to kill x at the loop. But if that doesn't happen, if x is equal to 3, it's not going to print this. Continue means skip everything after that, go back up to the top of the loop and reiterate. So it's not going to get to print out 3, because we don't print out the number until after the continue statement. So it's going to print out 0, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. There we go. So, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, 0. A, B, C, H, I, J, 1. A, B, C, H, I, J, 2. And then the 3 is the, is the sticky point because it does print out A, B, C, D, E, but then it hits the X is equal to 3, so it continues, so it doesn't do that part, which is why we see it reset and then go A, B, C, E, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, 4. We can see that it never printed out 3. And then it does it again for 5. And then now it's cruising down with X is now set to 6. So it prints out A, B, C, D, E. But then it breaks before it can print out F, G, H, you know, and print its number out. So it's like a reset? Continue is, it's almost a reset. It's a reiterate. It's a go back to top and reiterate right thing now. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you can have a whole bunch of continues in there. You can't just put, I mean, it's... You can have a whole bunch of breaks for whatever conditions. Now, generally, using breaks and continues can make your loops harder to read. If you start throwing in a lot of different breaks and a lot of continues, then your brain can get boggled looking at it. You know, if, as long as it's written right and the computer can run it, that's great. But it can get harder for the human brain to process it. Why don't we take a little break and then come back here at about 835. So bathroom break, coke break, whatever. So why might you want to use the continue keyword? Well, it's nice to have a way of getting it to reset back up to the top of the loop. For example, our error handling. You know, when I, when we had our, our data validation code, please enter a test score. And we insisted that they, you know, that they entered good data by looping until we had a good piece of data. Well, we could do something a little bit similar. Here's how I would do it. Let's write some code that will ask for a series of seven temperatures representing days of the week. The temperatures, for whatever reason, cannot be below zero. It's dumb, but whatever. Okay, instead of uh, temperatures, let's do rainfall, where a restriction about negative values is actually valid. For now, all the loop is going to do is say data entered. We'll make it a little bit better. We'll make it add to a sum and stuff like that. Okay, so representing the days of the week, I can make it count from zero, you know, to six or one to seven, something like that. Int DOW for day of week is equal to 
I am going to start at a zero. We're going to go from zero to six. We're grown up programmers now. Zero based indexing. If we were using an array, we could be using an array to print out the days of the week. You know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever. That'd be cooler, but okay. Although, that being said, if we're actually going to be spitting out a number, the user won't want to see a number one. I mean, a number zero. I've changed my mind. Convince myself I'm going to make it from one to seven. All righty. So, let's do this. I'm just going to make it while true. Or while DOW is less than or equal to 7. Let's do that. Now let's ask for the temperature. We're going to need a temperature variable. Excuse me, a rainfall variable. I guess we could make it a double so that they can enter fractional rainfalls. Now let's tell them what to do. Enter a rainfall for day number, end quote, arrow, arrow, D-O-W, arrow, arrow, E-N-D-L. Maybe arrow, arrow, space, in space, like that. Maybe even a nice snazzy colon to let them know that that's what they're, where they're going to type. So D-O-W, arrow, arrow, quote, colon, space, end quote, semicolon. Now let's let them type it in. C-I-N, arrow, arrow, rainfall. But we don't allow negative values. So we're going to check. If rainfall below zero, if rainfall less than zero, we're going to give them a, a subtle error message. Rainfall cannot be negative. Backslash end, end quote. And then we're going to continue. This is an alternate idea for what I was showing at the beginning of the class, where you have a while loop that you know sits there and repeats until the user enters a good piece of data. This is similar. I'd have to think about how to expound on that. Let's go ahead and do something with it. So I'm just going to put a comment. We have good data. And just see out data entered, exclamation point, backslash in. Inner rainfall for day number one. Ten. Data entered. Inner rainfall for. Oh, I've got a problem. This is why I don't like using while loops. I always forget to put the update in it. What did I do wrong? I need to increase what? Need to add one to what? Yep, so plus plus DOW. All right. 78, 34. Now I'm going to try a negative value. Negative one. Rainfall cannot be negative. Now, the error message should be a little more emphatic than that. It ought to have asterisks or something around it, because that, that's pretty subtle. But at least it's still saying rainfall for day number five, right? It didn't skip over to six. So that's why I did the continue statement. Now, there's always more than one way to write this stuff, isn't there? We did not have to write this with a continue statement, and we could still get it to work. It's just showing you a possibility. What if we wanted to let them exit early? You know, or enter 999 to quit. We could throw that in as a break. 
we need to modify our input statement. Okay, so a few things to make it a little clearer. If we see the rainfall, I want to see hashtag error in front of it, just so that that blatantly pops up. And then above this, we're going to see out enter rainfall values. Entering 9999 will exit. That's going to be our sentinel value. Usually I make it a negative number, but we already ruled out negative numbers. So here, underneath it, or I could put it above, if rainfall is less than zero, let's just put it above. If rainfall is equal to our magic number, 99999, then we're going to break. Okay. Breaking. And then do a break. thing and then I'll bring the code back. I'm sorry, I'm covering the screen with it. All right. I don't know if this is the best data entry we've ever written, but I'm happy that it does a little bit of error checking. Could we have done the <coughs> error checking in another way? Absolutely. We could have done it as demonstrated at the beginning of the class where you have a while loop inside this other while loop, and it just clamps down on it until they finally typed in some good data. So this stuff down here, where I said we have good data, this would be where we would add it to an accumulator if we were creating a total of all of our rainfall or whatever. So the for loop, you perform the initialization, it does the test expression. If true, or at least it evaluates to non-zero, it executes the statement. If false, or at least it evaluate, or if it evaluates to zero, it terminates the loop execution. Now, why am I saying or if it's zero or non-zero? Because C++ is built on top of the C language, and on the C language, if you do something like this, while x, it'll keep running until x becomes zero. The C language, unless you include some he um, particular header files that were added recently, does not support the Boolean data type. You just use ints or something like that, and you treat zero as, as false and non-zero like a one as true. So in your for statement, if whatever was here could evaluate to zero as your indicator that it was supposed to bail out, then you could do that. I'm not going to even bother trying to demonstrate that. Just kind of tuck away that in the back of your head that anywhere that a Boolean expression is expected like that, what it's ultimately testing for is zero or non-zero. So perform the initialization, ex evaluate the test expression, execute the update, then reevaluate the test expression. So if you think about the order in which things are done, that's done one, that's done twice, Excuse me, I shouldn't say one and twice. That's done first, second, third, and then fourth. Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. Right? Because the initialization will never be done again past the first step. So it's got to do the initialization, it's got to do the test, and then it executes the body of the code. 
once the block body of the code is done, it does the update. And then it performs the test again. Yes, sir. Inside. When you're using a for loop. Okay, sorry, sorry, I understand your question now. If this update was outside of the loop, if it was before the last brace, it would never happen. If you're talking about a while loop. If you're talking about a for loop, if you didn't put it inside the parentheses, if you put it outside the parentheses, then it would treat it like you had no update condition at all. Does that make sense? Okay. So here they just printed out a table and it's squared using a for loop rather than a while loop. And we've already done that. So when to use a for loop? In any situation that clearly requires an initialization, a false condition to stop the loop, and an update to occur. That doesn't explain when to use it. That explains how to use it. The when to use it is if you're counting over a, a series of values. That's pretty much it. But that's pretty broad, actually. So if you're counting over a series of values, you're probably going to initialize something. You're going to have some condition that indicates when it stops, and you're going to have some update to continue. You could warp the uh, syntax of the for loop to do a lot of things that, anyways, I'll, I'll skip that. So the for loop is a pretest loop, meaning that it tests the condition before it prints. So if count is initialized to 11, it's not going to print hello because the condition is just checked for 10. You can have multiple statements in the initialization expression. If you're going to define the variables on the fly like that, we just figured out, though, that they had to all be of the same type when you defined them. But if you define them above the initialization, then they could be of all any types that you wanted. You can also have multiple statements in a test expression. Just separate them all by commas. And you can omit the initialization expression. can declare variables in the initialization. This is my favorite thing to do. I like doing that. Because that way I can declare my counter and I know that my counter disappears after the body of the code. And I know that I'm not conflicting with any other counter already in use. So keeping a running total. A running total is when you're processing a series of data and you're just adding them on, like folding scores. You know. I roll a strike, I roll a this, I roll, you know, I roll a that. So you need an accumulator variable to hold the running total, sum. You know, and then each time we get a new number, add it to sum. Once we're done with the loop, we can print out the sum. Why don't we write an edgy bidgy little loop that does that, but we're also going to keep track of how many values we've entered. So we're going to need a counter as well. This one is just assuming that we're entering 10 values. I'd rather write it like our other loop to where we're entering data or we have the option to exit. So for that one, I'm just going to make it a while true loop. That's kind of my default for this kind of data entry if I don't know how many pieces of data I'm going to enter. So double sum equals zero, int count is equal to zero. That's going to be the number of items that we have entered. And then while true. Since this expression is just a Boolean true, it should loop forever until a break is hit. So let's see out something. Enter score or minus one to quit, colon, space, 
end quote, backslash, uh, excuse me, semicolon. Now we need a score variable. Ant score, float score, double score, whatever. Double score, CIN arrow, arrow into score. Now let's check for negative 1. If score equals equals negative 1, then break. Now by the time we get here, we don't have any other data validation going on. We could, you know, score cannot be negative, score cannot be greater than 100, whatever. We could do that with our continue statements like we did in the example above. Yeah, why not? They're going to wonder why we didn't tell them right off the bat, but let's do that. If score is less than zero or two vertical bars, score greater than 100, let's print out an error message, see out, score must be between zero and 100 inclusive. We're going to assume that they're mathematicians and know what it's inclusive means. Backslash n. And then continue. All right, once we have a good piece of data, which we should by the time we get here, we can add it onto the sum. So sum equals sum plus score, or sum plus equals score. And then count plus equals one. Excuse me, just how about plus plus count? That would do it. Or count plus plus. That's the number of scores. All right, once they've exited the loop by typing in negative one, we can calculate the average. And the average is just equal to the sum divided by the count. So after our loop ends, double space average equals score divided by count, and then see out arrow arrow, let's print out average score is space end quote arrow arrow average. I've got a bug in the line above. It should not be score divided by count. Anyways, average score is end quote arrow arrow average arrow arrow India. And what should that actually be? Yeah, that should just have been some. getting to that annoying point where every time we test our program we have to enter a lot of test data. But at least entering 9999 will exit that first loop so I don't have to do that. Enter a score. 10, 20, 30, 40, negative 1. Well, no, I haven't tested it to make sure it's a valid date. What about 990? Nope, score must be between 0 and 100 inclusive. How about negative 10? Nope, score must be between 0 and 100. Okay, negative 1. Average score is 25. So that's working. I don't know if I'm making these uh, breaks and continue examples annoyingly complex or not. If they're sticking in your head and you're going, yeah, I totally get it, that's great. These things could always be rewritten in some other fashion. This could have been written as a for loop, but there would be no test condition on it. I'm not sure what the test condition would be anyways. It could have been written as a while with their, an actual loop control variable rather than true. This is just the way that my mind works on these things. You're not going to see book examples that follow the same logic. The only thing that I can think of doing that would make the code cleaner would be to write a function that would do the input and rule out the invalid data. And if we had done that, don't, don't do this because I'm not going to actually write that. 
then we would be able to get rid of all of this code and replace it with one call. It would look something like this. Score equals get score, like that, right? And get score would handle, I forgot to declare. Get score would handle all the error handling. And yeah, if it was equal to negative one break, otherwise we would add it. There. That's what it would look like. And that would be cleaner. So once we're using functions a lot, you could tidy up your code in such a fashion, it looks better, in my opinion. And when I say it looks better, if it's easier to read, it's probably easier to maintain. The complexity of handling the negative values and the values that are too large and all that stuff is encapsulated. It's tucked and hidden away inside of a function. And I'm going to undo that. So keeping a running total, you set your accumulator, your sum, your total equal to zero. Is there a number to read? Indeed there is. Read it, add it to the accumulator, and then keep going. We just had one extra thing. We were also keeping track of the counter so that we knew how many values we had read. And as reading the number, we made it a little bit more complex. We had it rule out values that were too small, too large, and we allowed it to use negative one as a break. But conceptually, so sentinel values. The sentinel is a value in the list of values that indicates the end of data. Inner score, negative one to quit. Inner rainfall, or 999 to stock. It's a special value that cannot be confused with a valid value. Your teacher would have to be a real jerk to give you a negative one on your exam. Negative 999 is a perfectly good signal value. Anything that is not acceptable data, so like inner patient name, or, and we need some kind of value that would let them quit. Maybe the word STOP in all caps, and we're hoping, against all hope, that nobody's ever named their patient STOP in all caps. So it's a special value that's not valid data that is used to terminate the input if you do not know how many values will be entered or if you want to let them quit early. So when we were entering test scores, we were making the assumption that we did not know how many pieces of data enter. And that's why we had that if statement, if score is equal to negative one. That way, negative one could be used as our signal value to let us get out of it. And the reason I worded it that way is because there's an alternate way. There's always more than one way to do this. We could have done this, enter test score and you type in 100. And then, do you wish to keep going? Y in. And so they type in Y. And then, enter test score, you know, and they type in a different test score. They made an 87. Do you wish to keep going? Yes. Enter test score. They made a 95. Do you wish to keep going? Do you wish to continue? That's about actually what it would say, not keep going. They finally get tired of it. Enter test score. That person's made a zero. Do you wish to keep going? No. And then they stop. Okay, done. That's called termination by user query. Right? Exit. Enter the data and then ask them if they want to keep going. Enter the data and then ask them if they want to keep going. Enter the data. That, that's a perfectly valid way to handle that situation where you have an indeterminate number of items. Or you could do it like this, enter test score or minus one to quit. Excuse me while I take a moment to do some cut and pasting. If I was doing data entry as my full-time job, I'd rather be able to do it like this, right? That way I could just use the, the numeric keypad, you know, and keep hitting enter, and when I'm finally ready to do, I enter the special keystroke and I'm done. 
rather than typing in a number, hit enter, and then type in a response, and hit enter, and then type in another number, and hit enter, and type in a response. So this is termination by user query, which is a totally valid way of doing it. And this is termination by Sentinel value. User query is totally awesome for things like, you know, game over, do you wish to repeat, why in? You know, if you've just done a whole bunch of stuff, it's finally done, great, do user query. But if you're entering a series of values and asking the user queries is going to double the amount of things that they have to type or more, then I'd recommend finding some way to use a Sentinel value instead. Now, Sentinel values can apply to files that you read as well as data that's being entered by hand, right? If you're reading from a file, you could say, okay, if we ever reach a negative one in our data, that's the end of the data and I'm going to close the file. Or you could just say, once I reach the end of file, that's my supposed term sentinel value and I'm going to stop. And we get to file I.O. in this chapter. I'm not going to get to it today, I would expect. So here's a sentinel value. A game counter to hold a number of points accumulator. Enter the number of points your team has earned. Enter a negative one when you are finished. And then so while points is not equal to negative one. See, they wrote this without a true, without a, uh, without a while true. Something bugs me about the way they did this though. Okay, this is the one with the priming read again. I've already mentioned the priming reads. You ask for your input here, and then you process the input and you ask for the input a second time. I've been using break to avoid having to do this double input step where you display the in prompt and then you use the CIN. That's happening twice. That's not my preference, but it is how the books just universally show it. So this is using a priming read to enter our data and it's still allowing negative one to be used as a signal value. And if you write it that way, you don't have to have an if or a break in the middle of your while. So conceptually, I suppose it is cleaner. I just don't like having a copy and pasting of any code. And here, doing CIN points there, and CIN points there, smacks of copying and pasting. Same idea though. They're gonna get to enter scores until they finally enter points of negative one. deciding which loop to use. The while loop is a conditional pretest loop. It iterates as long as a certain condition exists, not exits. You can use while loops to validate input. You can read lists of data terminated by a sentinel. Those are all perfectly good uses of a while loop. The do while loop is a post test loop that you want to always iterate at least once. And their suggestion is use it for repeating a menu. Okay. And then the for loop is a pretest loop. For two, the for loop is good. Built in expressions for initializing, testing, and updating. Situations where the exact iteration of, exact number of iterations is known. That's kind of vague, or maybe it's very precise. If you're going over a series of values, that's when I would use a for loop. A series of values could be something that's being calculated on the fly. You know, x is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or it could be a series of items that you're pulling from an array, you know, a list, something like that. But when you're, you're going through a series of values, but they're saying where the exact iterations is known. I don't like wording it this way because it's not really, what if the exact number of iterations is being calculated? Right? What if you don't know how much RAM they have? So you query the machine and you find out that it has two gigabytes and that lets you perform a certain number of iterations, whereas for somebody else, you know, I guess you know the exact number of iterations the code does, the programmer doesn't. The code the programmer has has it perform a calculation in order to do it. So if I was gonna write these reword them slightly, and you could always use the book definitions if I ask you on an exam, but so, when to use a do loop? So, 
So use for something that iterates that must be iterated. That must iterate at least once. They say menus. Like display a menu and then perform the choice that the menu uses. So that would be something like this. Do, you know, see out one for this, two for that, or three to quit. And then you see I in into your choice. And I guess then you'd have some if statements. If choice is equal to one, do something. Else if choice is equal to two, do something else. And then just stop there. Else if choice is equal to three, see out. Goodbye. And then your while clause would be while choice is not equal to three. So you know that we are going to be displaying the menu at least one time. Better declare your choice variable beforehand. But it doesn't matter whether you initialize it or not because it's not a pretest loop. And I kind of uh, lost the plot here and stopped putting parentheses and stuff like that. I'll fix that now. That's their suggestion as to when you want to use a do loop for menu-based programming. Is there more than one way to do that kind of menu? Yeah, of course. Honestly, I don't. I can't think of. Well, we'll Google it up. Use a do loop when you want to repeat a set of statements an indefinite number of times until a condition is satisfied. If you want to repeat the statements a set number of times, a for next is a better way. Ah, this do, it must be Visual Basic that has the do until that I was thinking. All right, here's a question. When is a good reason to use a do loop? The do loop ensures that the body executes at least once. I wrote a lengthy response to a question. Is there a reason to use a while instead of a for? The for loop can do anything that the while loop takes up fewer lines of code. I would suggest reading that. Perhaps you've written it. Okay, fine. That does not explain why. Can we just take it on faith that if you come across a situation where the body of the loop has to execute at least once, that's when you use a do loop. Is that good enough? All right, all right. So when to use a do loop? The do while, you use it for something that must iterate at least once. For loop. Use when the number of iterations can be known or to process a series of values. And then a while loop otherwise. but they give specific examples of using a while loop. Well, examples. Validating input or reading a list of data terminated by a signal. Use when the number of iterations is known or to count through a range of values. Yes, I'm happy enough with that. Hope y'all are happy with that. That makes
make sense? All right. Nested loops. A nested loop is inside of a loop. You have your outer loop and your inner loop, just like you can nest if statements. You can have an outer if statement and an inner if statement. Let's use nested loops to print out a multiplication table. Let's use nested for loops. So we're going to have, you know, the outer loop is going to handle printing row by row. The inner loop is going to handle printing the columns. So let's print a multiplication table using nested loops. Let's, I guess, print 0 through 9. So for int row is equal to 0, row is less than or equal to 9, row plus plus. And for int column is equal to 0, column is less than or equal to 9. Call plus plus. Now let's use set w to make things look all fancy. C out, arrow, arrow, set w. The largest value we're going to have is like 81. Even if we went out to 10, the largest value we would have would be 100, which is three spaces and adding a space that would be 4. So let's set the width to 4, followed by parentheses row times call. In parentheses and semicolon. Now the program, I'm going to cut this stuff and move it up to the top of main because I'm tired of having to do that data entry. So. Cutting that, running up to the top of main, and I'm putting it as the very first code in main. Now the code as it exists has got a little bit of a bug. I want it to be a table, but it's not going to print a table. It's going to just be one giant line of data. Scroll up. Yes, I can. All right, you see what it did? It printed out the first row. It printed out the second row. It printed out the third row. I need to add an ENDL output somewhere to cause it to go to the end, to go to the next line. Like I wanted to print all these zeros out and then stop printing here, do an ENDL, and then pick up from there. So in my loop, where would be a good place to add an ENDL in order to get it stopped? What, what would happen if I put it here? It's not going to look good. Oh, and since I don't want it to do the rest of that, I'm going to do a system pause here. But anyways, okay, so if I run it now, I've added the ENDL. Oh, well, that didn't work. That's not what I want. I want it to look like a multiplication table. So that wasn't a good place to stick it. Where where would be a good place? Outside of the inner for loop. Yep, outside of the inner for loop. Right there. See out, ENDL. All right, there we go. Maybe I'd like for it to go all the way to 10 in each direction. So I think I'm going to change row less than or equal to 9 to less than or equal to 10. Story. Sure. And just as a reminder, yeah, if you put a semicolon here and or here, it breaks the code. Because what it's really doing is it's treating it like this. Do a for loop and then process this little block of nothing. And then do a for loop and process this little block of nothing. And so these variables that we've defined down here, they no longer exist. They look like they exist because of braces, but they don't. Because these variables, rho, exist only inside this 
pair of imaginary braces there before the semicolon. And this variable call exists only in those, that imaginary code between the braces there. And so they do not exist there. That is one argument for putting the opening braces on the same line. should have just undone, undid what I did. Okay. You'll see a lot of programmers do it like that. They like to put their opening braces on the same line as the for header or the while header or the if header or the, or the function header. I like doing it in the block style, so that's why I always space it out like that. But if you had written it like this, then if you saw a semicolon there, it would be real clear what was wrong. So things to note about nested loops, the inner loop goes through all repetitions for every repetition of the outer loop. That's the way that we were able to print an entire row. This loop had to begin and end completely, and only when it was done would the outer loop execute again. Kind of like when you're clocking, um, counting you know, seconds and minutes and hours. Right? You've got to do all the seconds before you can increment the minute. And then you do all the seconds again in an increment a minute. And then do seconds again in increment a minute. Which gives me... Eh, maybe not. I was thinking that'd be a fun, fun one to write, but... Nah. Okay, so points on the nested loops. The inner repetitions complete sooner than the outer loop because they have to. And the total number of repetitions is the number of repetitions times. It's the product of the two. So how many numbers did we print out? Originally, when we were going from 0 to 9, how many is that? If you count out, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that's actually 10 values. So our original table was 10 by 10, which is 100. So we did 100 iterations. But now that we changed it to print out 0 to 10, how many values are there really? There's 11, and so it's 11 times 11. So we actually printed out 121 different pieces of data. But the number of iterations is the number of the outer row times, outer row, I mean outer uh, loop, times the number of iterations of the inner loop. That's what I was expecting. Use files for data storage. And that's a little bit beyond where I want to get to at this point. But I guess what I'll mention as a sneak preview of what we're going to be talking about next time is that file streams let us write to files using the same arrow arrow indicators. And file streams let us read from files using the same arrow arrow, the stream insertion operators. Which means taking a program and converting it from writing to a screen to saving to a file, if it's been using using stream IO, if it's been written that way, is really easy. Okay. Say so, homework. Part A. Pass the user for the number of rows and the number of columns and then print a rectangle of that many rows and columns using asterisks. Example. If rows is equal to 5 and columns is equal to 7, then here's what I would print. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. They would do that five times. Oh, you. Yeah. Write a program that will sum, calculate the summation of.
all the numbers between 1 and x where the user has specified x. In other words, ask the user for x and then do the calculation. Then display the sum. If you need help on that one, just Google summation loop. some silly ones. Write a for loop that will count from 1 to 500, from 0 to 500 by 50s. Ask the user how old they are and then print happy birthday once for each year. If they say they are 37, print happy birthday 37 times. And lastly, ask the user to enter 10 values. Print plus if the number is greater than 0, minus if the number is less than 0, or equal if the number is 0. So something like this. So they type in a, a 6. Wow, that's greater than 0. Then they type in a negative 3. How about we print out something a little bit more interesting than that? Print. That is positive. Or just positive negative or zero. And so on. So all of these should use loops. I don't see a particular reason why any of them should have to use a do loop. This one wouldn't have to have been a for loop, but I specified a for loop. Would you use a for loop or a while loop for asking the user how old they are and then printing happy birthday? And the answer is you could do either one. I like for loops just because I never forget to put the update, whereas I always do on the while. You've seen me do that several times in a row. Forget to put the update in my loops. You're probably more careful than I am. That could be written using a for loop. I probably would do so. In fact, this looks like a real heavy for loop kind of thing to me. This one might be easily done with a, uh, a while. None of them did I make you do a sentinel value. But if you were going to implement a sentinel value, then this might be a nice one, but I'm not sure what the sentinel value would need to be because this is, a, this is accepting any you know number positive or negative, so making negative one the sentinel value would be dumb. So, nah, no sentinel values on that. We'll have plenty of other opportunities to ask for that. So does that make sense? Does somewhere look good? Five short tasks, hopefully short. All right.
we'll make them do someday. hit the end of the lecture that I wanted to get to, and we got to it a little bit more quickly than I had expected. So I want to play with some concepts that we haven't really talked about yet. This is way early to be introducing the ideas, but I want us to have multiple .cpp files. And so what we're going to do is come over here to view your solution explorer. And let's add a second file. So do a right click, add new item, and just call it maybe functions.cpp. Functions.cpp. And click add. All right. I'm going to just go and take my boilerplate from the first one. IO stream, string, and IO manip. We only used one of those, but no, we did wind up using IO manip. And I'm going to paste that up at the top of the other one. Now, this one's not going to have a main method. Your project should only have one main method, because otherwise, how would, the, uh, how would C know which main you wanted to run? But we can stick functions in here. We're just going to write some dummy functions void say hi that takes a string called name and so what does it do it see outs it doesn't know what a string is I haven't done using namespace std so it's expecting me to prefix string with std colon colon so I am going to do using namespace std using namespace std Okay, so see out, arrow, arrow, hello, space, end quote, arrow, arrow, name, arrow, arrow, quote, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, backslash in, end quote, semicolon. So we have a function there. Now let's write a function that multiplies two numbers together. Or, nah, let's write one that takes the square root of something. So double sq root, and it's going to accept a parameter that's a number, n. And we're going to calculate the square root by taking the power of it to 0 0.5. So double ret for ret val to result. Double result is equal to POW n comma 0 0.5. Take our number and raise it to the power of 1 half. That'll give you the square root of it. And then return the result. Now we want to be able to call these functions from inside our main code. But we have a problem. These are set defined in a completely different .cpp file. So if we try to call them, it's not going to work. I don't want to flip past this screen until I don't hear any more keystrokes. So. so what we're going to have to do is we're going to define function prototypes. And the function prototypes will tell the main how to call. And, well, it tells the compiler how this function is to, what it needs to return, and then what kind of parameters it accepts. Can I flip, or do we need more time on this page, which is fine? Okay. All right. So we're going to come here. And, for example, if we did this, say hi, parentheses, Bob. Not going to work. Because it doesn't know the syntax for our say hi function. So I need to tell it. I'm going to declare a prototype. I'm going to come over here and do... 
void say hi parentheses string name in parentheses. It looks just like the function, except it doesn't have a body. So the prototype is a function header terminated by a semicolon that tells the compiler what that function returns and what kind of data it accepts. Now we can do that. But we had another function as well. So double dd is equal to sq root of 75. Not going to work because it doesn't know what sq root is. So I'm going to come back over here to functions.cpp and grab that function header, paste it, and put a semicolon. So I'm going to flip over to our functions code. I'm going to grab the header, double sq root, double n. I'm going to come back and I'm going to paste it here. Put a semicolon there. Okay, now it knows how to do both of those things. Now suppose we had 100 C files in this project. We wouldn't want to have to define the function prototypes each and every time in each and every .cpp file. We'd rather they go in a header. The header is where you should be putting your uh, function prototypes and perhaps all of your pound sign defines as well. So I want to make a header that has these two things in it. So if we're all good so far, well, let's test it before we start getting too fancy. I want to make sure it at least compiles and runs. Okay, it did print hello Bob, I'm feeling good about it. I didn't print out the square root, but I guess we can assume it works. See out arrow arrow, square root of 75 is space, end quote, error, error, dd, error, error, ndl. Looks good to me, 8.66, I can believe that. All right, but I don't want to have to put these prototypes in each and every. So instead, I'm going to go and right click on source files and do add new item. But when I do add new item, I'm not going to choose source file, I'm going to choose header. So new item, header file. What title we're going to give it, I'm just going to call it the same thing as, uh, maybe I'm going to call it functions.h. Just because my C file was called functions.cpp, kind of ma making a match. All right, now there's nothing in it. I'm going to go and grab those prototypes. Go back to your main code cut those two prototypes you defined, go to your H file, and paste them. Now it doesn't even know what a string is. Well, let's see if that's really a problem. Let's go back to June25.cpp and do a pound sign include, because we need to include our own header file. We don't have a header file yet. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do pound sign include but I'm not going to use angle braces. When you're calling one of your own header files, one that's in the same directory you're in, you use double quotes instead. So functions.h. And so there could be hundreds of functions in my CPP file, and I would define all the prototypes for them in my .h file. And then when any other piece of code needed access to those functions, it would just do pound sign include functions.h and get all the prototypes at once. I would have been disappointed if I had not broken somebody's code. Resume and point this out. All right, we made a small change to our code here for functions.h. We made it look like this pound sign include string, we added that, and we could have either added using namespace std, but instead we just prefixed our string with std colon colon. And by doing that, we were able to avoid making it dependent of where you put include functions.h. That was working correctly because we put it below the using namespace, but if it had been up above it, it would not have worked. Alrighty. 
So let's go back to functions.cpp. These are our functions. That's that file. And so we'll do a review on Wednesday. If you've turned in any more quizzes, they will be graded by Wednesday as well. So I will see you all Wednesday. Give me both CPP files and the H file. So as a last look of what we did, here is our original .cpp file. The pound sign includes, etc. Here's where we used our brand new functions. We added this code to our main. We should only have one main function, our original function, which is inside our original .cpp file. So when we add our pound sign include functions, we better use the single quote, the double quotes there rather than the angle braces because this header file is in the same directory as our CPP file. And so here's what our functions.h file looks like. And here's our functions.cpp file itself. Do all that and then submit to the Dropbox your two CPP files and your header file.